Hi Year 3, over the next couple of weeks um, I'm going to be reading to you Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl. If we were in school this is what we would have been looking at in Spring 2 term. Okay, so I've got some comprehension questions for each chapter of the book. Okay, so this video is for chapter 1. The first question before we even open the book is can you list all the things on the front cover that you can see? And if any of these details give you any clues as to what the story might be about. Now, I know you already know the story, but if you can link some of the things that you can see, okay, and use those as your reasons why you think something's going to happen in the story. Okay, so pause the video if you want to have a little closer look. Okay. So, chapter one. Here comes Charlie. These two very old people are the father and mother of Mr. Bucket. Their names are Grandpa Joe and Grandma Josephine. And these two very old people are the father and mother of Mrs. Bucket. Their names are Grandpa George and Grandma Georgina. This is Mr. Bucket. This is Miss, Mrs. Bucket. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket have a small boy whose name is Charlie Bucket. This is Charlie. How do you do? And how do you do? And how do you do again? He is pleased to meet you. The whole of this family, the six grown-ups, count them, and little Charlie Bucket live together in a small wooden house on the edge of a great town. The house wasn't nearly large enough for so many people, and life was extremely uncomfortable for them all. There were only two rooms in this place altogether, and there was only one bed. The bed was given to the four old grandparents because they were so old and tired. They were so tired, they never got out of it. Grandpa Joe and Grandma Josephine on this side, Grandpa George and Grandma Georgina on this side. Mr and Mrs Bucket and little Charlie Bucket slept in the other room, upon a mattress on the floor. In the summertime, this wasn't too bad. But in the winter, freezing cold drafts blew across the floor, and all night long it was awful. There wasn't any question of them being able to buy a better house, or even one more bed to sleep in. They were far too poor for that. Mr Bucket was the only person in the family with a job. He worked in a toothpaste factory, where he sat all day long at a bench and screwed the little caps onto the tops of the tubes of toothpaste after the tubes had been filled. But a toothpaste cap screwer is never paid very much money, and poor Mr Bucket, however hard he worked, and however fast he screwed on the caps, was never able to make enough to buy one half of the things that so large a family needed. There wasn't even enough money to buy proper food for them all. The only meals they could afford were bread and margarine for breakfast, boiled potatoes and cabbage for lunch, and cabbage soup for supper. Sundays were a bit better. They all looked forward to Sundays because then, although they had exactly the same, everyone was allowed a second helping. The buckets, of course, didn't starve, but every one of them the two old grandfathers, the two old grandmothers, Charlie's father, Charlie's mother, and especially little Charlie himself, went about from morning till night with a horrible empty feeling in their tummies. Charlie felt it worst of all, and although his father and mother often went without their own share of lunch or supper so they could give it to him, it still wasn't nearly enough for a growing boy. He desperately wanted something more filling and satisfying than cabbage and cabbage soup. The one thing he longed for more than anything else was chocolate. Walking to school in the mornings, Charlie could see great slabs of chocolate piled up high in the shop windows. and He would stop and stare and press his nose against the glass, his mouth watering like mad. Many times a day, he would see other children taking bars of creamy chocolate out of their pockets and munching them greedily. And that, of course, was pure torture. 
Only once a year on his birthday did Charlie Bucket ever get to taste a bit of chocolate. The whole family saved up their money for that special occasion. And when the day arrived, Charlie was always presented with one small chocolate bar to eat all by himself. And each time he received it on those marvellous birthday mornings, he would place it carefully in a small wooden box that he owned and treasure it as though it was a bar of solid gold. And for the next few days, he would allow himself only to look at it, but never to touch it. Then at last, when he could stand it no longer, he would peel back a tiny bit of the paper wrapping at one corner and expose a tiny bit of chocolate. And then he would take a tiny nibble, just enough to allow, allow the lovely sweet taste to spread out slowly over his tongue. The next day, he would take a t another tiny nibble, and so on, and so on. And in this way, Charlie would make his sixpenny bar of birthday chocolate last him for more than a month. But I haven't to if I haven't told you yet about the one awful thing that tortured little Charlie, the lover of chocolate, more than anything else. This thing for him was far, far worse than seeing the slabs of chocolate in the shop windows or watching other children munching bars of creamy chocolate right in front of him. It was the most terrible, torturing thing that you could imagine, and it was this. In the town itself, actually within sight of the house in which Charlie lived, there was an enormous chocolate factory. Just imagine that. And it wasn't simply an ordinary enormous chocolate factory either. It was the largest and most famous in the whole world. It was called Wonka's Factory, owned by a man called Mr. Willy Wonka, the greatest inventor and maker of chocolate that there has ever been. And what a tremendous and marvellous place it was. It had huge iron gates leading into it and a high wall surrounding it and smoke belching from its chimneys and strange whizzing sounds coming from deep inside it. And outside the walls, for half a mile around in every direction, the air was scented with the heavy, rich smell of melting chocolate. Twice a day, on his way to and from school, little Charlie Bucket had to walk right past the gates of the factory. And every time he went by, he would begin to walk very, very slowly. And he would hold his nose high in the air and take long, deep sniffs of the gorgeous chocolatey smell all around him. Oh, how he loved that smell. And oh, how he wished he could go inside the factory and see what it was like. OK, so that's the end of chapter one. I've got some questions for you. OK, so get your paper and your pencils ready. Number one, where is the story set? Number two, why do you think the author chose this setting? Number three, why was life so uncomfortable for the Bucket family? Number four, what was that horrible empty feeling in their tummies? Number five, how do you think this horrible feeling made them feel? Number six, how do you think it would make you feel if you had that feeling in your tummy all day, every day? And why do you think it would make you feel that way? Number seven. Describe how Charlie would feel eating real life chocolate. OK, so using lots and lots of detail, how do you think he would feel? Think about his emotions, his thoughts, his feelings. Number eight. Why do you think the chocolate factory has huge iron gates and a high wall surrounding it? Number nine, imagine you are Charlie. Okay, you're stood outside the gates of the chocolate factory, maybe on your way to or from school. You're staring at it, you can smell all that melted chocolate in the air, you can hear all those whizzing and whirring sounds. How do you feel? Write down your thoughts and your feelings as if you are Charlie stood outside those gates. Okay, you might want to write it maybe in like a little short diary entry 
or maybe in thought bubbles coming from your head if you want to draw your character. Okay, your choice, but describe, write down your thoughts and your feelings as if you were Charlie. And the final question, question number 10, summarize this chapter that we've read in five sentences, no more than five sentences. So to summarize, that means write down briefly what this chapter was about. So not lots and lots of detail, just short, brief sentences. Summarize what this chapter is about in no more than five sentences. Okay, and then you can watch the next video for chapter two, or you can replay this video to help you answer the questions. Okay, see you soon. Bye.